So if you'd stood at the center of debate about governance in 1944, not just the year that Iceland adopted its reformed Danish constitution, but a year at the close or near the hopeful close of a war and asked, what does the world need now? <clears throat> Not in the sense of the great singer sense, what the world needs now, but in a much more geeky sense of what would be good now for the world. The answer would be democracy, to spread democracy around the world. And indeed, in the period from 1944 until the present, that's exactly what happened. Democracy was spread everywhere to become the default way of thinking of how nations would be governed. Only rogues now deny the idea of rule by the people. But if then you asked, in fact, to what extent do the people rule, the answer is actually not so much. That this ideal of a system, this promise of a democracy, a system of governance where people felt and did in fact control the direction of their government has failed. And global dissatisfaction with democracy, with the idea of democracy has never been higher. This is true in the United States with the core institution of representative democracy, Congress now enjoys a confidence rating which hovers around the margin of error of the poll. Less than 10% have confidence in that, truth, that institution. And to a lesser extent, it's even true here. We don't have a similar graph, but in this measure of confidence, the, the parliament uh, in 2015 had a relatively low percentage. It's twice as high as it was in 2010, but nothing to be proud of. The core institution of representative democracy without the faith or the confidence of the people. We need to recognize that we're in the middle of a democracy crisis. A moment when the very idea that we all take for granted as the mode by which we shall govern ourselves is questioned and doubted and frustration pushes against it. We need to understand this crisis and to uh, understand its source, or I'd say its sources. And I think the source is something in us, namely in the people. It's something in them, namely the governments, and it's something standing between us and them, the role of a very special us within every modern democratic society, what we could call the elite. The elite. And it's the place of the elite that motivates me here today. It's common for people to recognize we're at a scary time internationally, where leaders, people vying to be leaders, are people like this in dark democracies around the world. That's scary. In America, many were scared even with the great Bernie Sanders. Many more are scared even with Hillary Clinton. These images of leaders scare people, but none of those scare me. What scares me is the growing skepticism about democracy among the elite. Comments like, what's wrong with the people? Or as I've heard it described, how could they be so stupid? What scares me is this elite sneer, the middle of this populist moment. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not, nor do I pretend to be a populist. As a Harvard law professor, I make the elite for a living. But this response, this sneer, is obtuse and oblivious, and it misses a critical truth about why we are here, and therefore it misses the urgent need for us to find a way to fix it. OK, so let's start with the easy problem, a description of the problem of them, of the problem of governments. It is a common refrain to describe democracies today across the world as corrupt. 
the corruption has invaded the realm. But I think it's important to recognize this is not corruption in an illegal sense of corruption, at least in the United States. Ballots are not stolen, voting machines are not hacked. The corruption that dominates democracy in the United States is not illegal, it's legal corruption. It's a corruption in a much cleaner, more modern sense, a more effective, a much more effective sense than breaking the law and bribing officials. It is not corrupting the vote. In a, in a very important way, it's corrupting who we can vote among. So this wonderful philosopher of political science, Boss Tweed, who ran Tammany Hall, which was New York City's most powerful political organization in the 19th century, used to say famously, quote, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. Now this image of control is central to understanding the nature of corruption in American democracy today. The idea that if you control the nominating, then the politicians realize that even though they need to be elected by the citizens, they must keep you happy first. This unrepresentative few who do the nominating then have extraordinary power within the political system. The consequence of that system, obviously, is to produce a system that will be responsive to these people who do the nominating, which people I will call tweeds only. Indeed, I want to call this system, this form of corruption, the nature of the way American democracy has been corrupted, tweedism. It has a crude form, which is obvious, and we've seen it many times across history. So in the Soviet Union, Soviet Union had a form of tweedism. There was an election. They had what looked like a democracy where everybody got to vote. But of course, the candidates were crudely and directly selected by the communist leaders in the Politburo. And to be able to run in the election, you had to do well in the Politburo. So 19 people effectively selected the candidates the 270 million people got to vote on. Or even today in Iran, there's an election in Iran, looks like a democracy, citizens get to vote. But of course, the candidates who get to run are those selected by the Guardian Council. To be able to run in that election, you have to make the Guardian Council happy with you. Therefore, all sorts of candidates are routinely denied the opportunity to run. So 12 people get to select the candidates that 50 million get to vote them on. But the real danger in Tweedism is not this crude form. The real danger is a much more subtle form of Tweedism, less familiar, but Tweeds who are effectively just as corrupt. So for example, look at a model of old Texas Tweeds. In Texas, in 1923, the state legislature passed a law that said only whites could vote in the Democratic primary. So there was an all-white primary in the only party that mattered because the Republican Party in 1923 was completely ineffective in the state of Texas. So Texas, like Iran, like the Soviet Union, had a two-stage election process where in the first stage, whites selected the candidates that then everyone got to vote among. And to run in that general election, you had to do well with the whites. And what that did in this two-stage process was to filter the candidates. So that by excluding 16% of the public from this critical first step, you had the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to whites only. This crude form of tweedism expressed in the form of race had an obvious effect to defeat the character of democracy in the South. But it's not just from the early parts of the last century. Think about Hong Kong. We remember about a year and a half ago in Hong Kong, the extraordinary protests that broke out, protesting the manner by which China proposed the governor of Hong Kong be selected. So this law said the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly no, uh, representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. Nominations by a committee. 
That committee was going to be 1,200 citizens, which means out of a population of 7 million is about 0.02% of Hong Kong. Now, 0.02% is a really tiny number. You can barely see it there, right? Here's what it looks like relative to the whole population of Hong Kong. That tiny corner is 0.02%. So what China said is this tiny committee would get to select the candidates. So to be able to run in the general election where all Hong Kong citizens could vote, you had to do very well in this nominating committee. And the concern of the protesters was that this filter would be biased. The 0.02%, as the leading protester, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, put it, were dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. This is not an all-white primary. It was an all-red primary. And the consequence of this primary, obviously, would be to produce a democracy responsive to China only. That, too, is an obvious example, like the Texas example, of a way to take what otherwise looks like a democratic form and render it undemocratic. But here's the most significant example, I think, in this, completely um, missed by the mainstream political candidates in the United States right now. In the United States, we take it for granted that political campaigns will be privately funded. But funding is its own contest. Funding is its own primary. It takes time. Members of Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time dialing for dollars. For any kids in the room, that's a telephone, right? So dialing for dollars, calling people from across the country to raise the money they need so that they can run their campaigns or for other candidates in their party to run their campaigns for victory. E.F. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push to get the sustenance it needed to survive. This is a picture of the modern American congressperson. As the modern American congressperson learns through this process which buttons he or she must push to get the sustenance his or her campaign needs to survive. It has an effect on that. They develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters. As they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on the issues 1 to 10, but on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, you know, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> so the point is, this is a primary too. It's the money primary. It's not a white primary, it's a green primary. And not in the sense of the left green party here, but green in the very crude sense of the primary that you need to win in order to raise the money you need to compete. So in this primary, to be able to run in the regular voting election as a member of Congress or a candidate Congress, you must do well in this green greenback primary. And so this structure thus filters the candidates to those who can succeed among the funders of these campaigns. So who are these funders? Well, we can think about the biggest funders. I don't think that's actually very interesting, even though the numbers are quite dramatic. Something like 50 Americans have given half the super PAC money in this election cycle so far. So the big funders are really huge funders, but the more important are the systematic influences. So think about the funders who give enough so that their contribution matters to a candidate. When the candidate's calling, dialing for dollars, they're thinking, what does she care about? So that when he or she votes as a representative, this attitude matters to that candidate. So we can be conservative. Let's say $5,200 is what matters. $5,200 in 2012 was the maximum amount you could give to one candidate in the full election cycle. So let's say that people who give $5,200 are the funders. They give enough to matter. If you talk to people in Washington, they would say that's way too conservative. $5,200 is nowhere close to the amount that you have to give so that you matter. 
but let's be as conservative as we can. Let's say it's $5,200. So if you give $5,200, you're one of these funders who matter. In 2012, it turns out 57,874 Americans gave the equivalent to $5,200 or more. 57,874 funders, relevant funders of these campaigns. And for those, for those of you doing the math, what you'll realize is 57,874 turns out to be 0.02% of America. 0.02% of America, this tiny fraction of the 1%, we could say a Chinese fraction of the 1% dominate this first stage with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to the funders only. The Princeton study, which is a Harvard professor I don't like to talk about, so put it off the stage as quickly as we can, um, by Martin Gillens and Ben Page, the largest empirical study of the actual decisions of our government in the history of political science, uh, relating those decisions to the attitudes of the economic elite, the attitudes of organized interest groups, and the attitudes of ordinary voters. And what they find with the economic elite is what you'd predict as the percentage of the elite who support something, the x-axis here, goes from zero to 100%, the probability of that policy being adopted goes up, the y-axis. So it goes from zero to about 36%, depending on what percentage of the elite likes something. That's the way democracy is supposed to work. The more who support it, the more likely it is it gets passed. Here's a picture of organized interest groups, a similar graph. The more who support it, the more likely it is it will pass. Here's the graph of the average citizens. That's a flat line, literally and figuratively. What that's saying is, it doesn't matter what the percentage of average citizens is who support a policy. It doesn't change the probability of that policy being enacted, as they describe it in English. When the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy in a democracy. In a democracy, the average voter is not mattering. The only measurable impact we can see independent is from the attitudes of the economic elite. So this was the picture I was taught of what our democracy would look like. There we are, the citizens, kind of middle America, they're driving the bus. But here's just the reality of this democracy. The steering wheel has become detached from the bus because we set up a system, a corruption of a system, that no longer makes them dependent on citizens. Instead, they are dependent on funders, and the attitudes of the funders are different from the attitudes of citizens. This is how democracy in America is corrupted. It's how it's corrupted now. Donald Trump notwithstanding, we don't steal ballots in America. We, don't, we select candidates. We don't select results. And we select them as subtly, as invisibly as possible. We meaning the elite. And we do this to produce a government that's responsive to the elite. And one that we, the people in America, increasingly loathe. Okay, that's the problem of them. Which then raises this question of the elite. Because the reality is, though they might not say this in public, in private, because I've been in these meetings, the elite will say, well, this system actually makes a lot of sense. This thing you call tweedism actually makes a lot of sense. Because we can't trust the people. You know, the people are ignorant. Whole wide range of issues. Listen to what the people say and then ask yourself, why trust them? <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. Why trust us? Why trust the people? In a certain way, they've got a point. We are pretty stupid, we the people. Well, we the Americans are particularly stupid. Um, measures of ignorance of American citizens are really quite embarrassing. We don't know anything. Wildly uninformed, biased and confused and ignorant in a really dramatic way. And poll after poll proves it. 
whether it's the results of Brexit, it's the fanaticism around this man, or in countries like Colombia, where you have a peace deal destroyed by a referendum, we seem to need, in democracies around the world, less democracy, not more. Or at least that's the attitude the elite effectively sell. So let's think a little bit about us. Because the more I've thought about it, I've realized there is an assumption that we've allowed to develop within, inside the idea of democracy today, an assumption that makes us seem stupid. And it's an assumption that uh, once one's spoken is obviously absurd. And the assumption is this. That what democracy means, the authority that democracy demands we respect, is what we all happen to think now. All of us at this minute. And we know that. We know what we all happen to think now because we have polls that go out there and ask us, what do we think now? And those polls are said to speak for us. They're said to say, here is what the people believe, and then the elite sneer at that because it's obviously stupid what the people believe because for many of these polls, at least about important issues, the results are ignorance. We, we means everyone now, universal and present. It's a kind of bizarre idea for what we might call democracy because why would we all know everything ever. Right? Why would we not be rationally ignorant? Because, of course, ignorant does not mean stupid. What ignorant means is that we don't know something we could have understood. I'm ignorant about all sorts of things, and I celebrate my ignorance because I think, my God, if I wasted my mind to understand American football, I would think less of myself. Why would I waste my efforts doing that? Now, I imagine I could understand American football. I don't think it's beyond me. It's not like string theory. I imagine I could if I wanted to, but I don't want to, so I don't. So I'm ignorant of American football. And in this sense, the people are ignorant. The people are ignorant about public policy issues. They are not stupid, they are ignorant. Of course we are ignorant, because we have lives. We have jobs, we have interests, and the interests are not politics 24-7. We are ignorant and not stupid. And what's stupid is the assumption that we would actually all know, or should all know, everything about these public policy issues always. That a poll should represent us. Instead, what I think we need to do is to recognize the silliness of that idea, that conception of democracy, that conception we've allowed to evolve within democratic culture and say that's not what democracy is. What democracy should mean is the judgments of the people that are a conclusion of a process where the people have had a chance to learn, to deliberate, and to decide where they've had the opportunity to understand, to discuss, and then make a decision. That's what democracy is. We should think of democracy on the model of a jury, not on the model of an opinion poll. And we should also say, unless the democracy has had that sort of process, what it says is not us. Because those people, those people who go through a process like that, the we, the people who understand issues like that, are not ignorant. Indeed, we know from social science that large, diverse, informed bodies of citizens can actually produce better judgments about complex public policy issues than the narrow elite. Scott Page's really fantastic book demonstrates this mathematically in the way we understand the role of diversity in public policy judgments. We can see from this type of research that the ideal deciders 
are the people properly informed with an opportunity to deliberate and to decide. And we should elevate this sense of us and bring it, revive it, make it a central part of what democracy means. Now, of course, we're not going to ever be able to silence the results of polls. There will always be polls. They will always compete with a conception of what the people can say. But what we can do is make better a parallel sense of us that competes with the polls through things like deliberative polls, randomly selected assemblies that give individuals an opportunity to deliberate, all ways to make democracy respectable, all ways to make a sensible people, a people within a democracy who understand enough to be responsible and respected for what they say. And what we need to do is to find and practice these ways to let the people speak. Okay, so I've told you a little about, about them, the problem with the government. I've told you a little bit about the elite and the elite's comfort with the current state of corruption. And I've described a little bit about what I think the problem with us, with the people, is right now under the conception of democracy that we have. And now I want to come around to why I'm here in Iceland. Because if you think of everything I've seen so far, you should now see what makes Iceland so cool, not in the temperature sense, but in the you know cool as in that's cool sense. So cool for democracy theorists and democracy activists around the world. You can see why any Democrat should love this incredible place and not just for its beauty. Because everything that democracy needs is happening and being practiced here. This is, in a microcosm, exactly the struggle and the effort at reforming the idea of democracy that I just described. In 2008, as you know, anger with the elites exploded in Iceland. And it produced a really extraordinary democratic initiative. The aim of this initiative was to eventually crowdsource a constitution. And the process of that crowdsourcing was literally unprecedented in the history of democratic constitutions. An unprecedented process, beginning first with a randomly selected thousand citizens who were brought together for the purpose of identifying values that a constitution should embrace given, I think, too abbreviated, but at least an opportunity to deliberate about what those values should be. And then second, a process by which experts could transform those ideas into a plan, a set of choices that a constitution would have to make. And then 25 people elected from 525 who ran an extraordinary idea in a population of 300,000 to sit on what would eventually be called a constitutional council, and a council that would begin a process of public deliberation by drafting over four months a series of drafts of this constitution that were commented upon by citizens in Iceland and because posted on Facebook by citizens around the world. Eventually producing a draft which had a referendum the first question of which, as translated on Wikipedia, was, do you wish the Constitution Council's proposals to form the basis of a new draft constitution? The basis of a new constitution. 67% of those voting said yes. Now, you should recognize, and as a teacher of comparative constitutional law, I offer this from some expertise, never before with any constitution anywhere has this been the process for crafting a constitutional document. Never before. 
And from the perspective of the flaws of democratic theory that I've identified, you can see why I look at that process and celebrate it. Because it mixes together the very best of what democracy could be. Celebrating random selection of people who are given an opportunity to deliberate with information. Informing citizen bodies like the Constitutional Council and giving them an opportunity to draft and take comments from a public. And a final stage where the public, after intense public uh, discussion, has the opportunity to say yes or no to the values that have been identified. This mixes the many ways we need to represent the people and gives a process that we should be celebrating as democratic the theorists. Not quibbling, because of course we could quibble, but celebrating because it is so distinctive in the history of how constitutions have been crafted. But then, so then what? <laughs> So now what? Because right now, the critical question Iceland faces is, will that democratic act count? Will it matter? Because now, either the elite in Iceland can ignore what happened, or they can embrace it. And they ignore what happened, either by doing nothing or by talking or by amending the old constitution. Because remember, the referendum was the basis of a new constitution. So to talk about, which is all they've done, to basically talk about how to amend the old constitution is to ignore what the referendum said. Or you can embrace it. And to embrace it is, again, to remember the core commitment, the basis of a new constitution. We begin, you would begin with this as the basis for the new constitution and craft a process to polish and perfect it and to enact it. Now, of course, six months ago, I think most thought this process dead. And what I've been incredibly excited about watching here is the political engagement that has tried to raise the significance of this um, organization, which I've been close to watching, CanYouHearUs.is, which has challenged the parties to commit to making a new constitution on the basis of the Constitutional Council's draft a priority in the next uh, parliament has succeeded in getting six parties to agree to that commitment, which on the latest poll, 53% chance this will be a governing coalition for this next government, all of which have committed to at least this statement as very distinct from these two leading parties, which one has um, flatly said no and the other has not responded to the polite emails requesting a position on this issue. Now, this democratic engagement to force this democratic process back into the middle of a political judgment by them, by the parliament, gives hope to thousands of democratic activists around the world. If you embrace this clear example of what we could think of as the new democracy, to give us, the people, a chance to speak sensibly and then to give them a chance to demonstrate respect, that would have enormous significance to democracy everywhere. And that significance is what I want to end on. In one of the um, ads of this uh, campaign, Can You Hear Us? Is, there's a wonderful statement, um, which roughly translates at the end, where one of the speakers says, governments are local, but democracy is global. This tiny country has had a process that, though local, has captured the imagination of Democrats everywhere. And of course, what you should do is obviously up to you. Obviously, it depends on what makes sense for you locally. But what you should recognize is that if you show success by the people, 
And if you show respect by the government, and even more importantly, by the elites, then you spread the potential, the possibility of this new direction for democracy everywhere. It's my view this Constitution would help you, but more, if I'm wrong about that, what I'm certain of is it would help us, us in the movement for democracy, and very specifically us in the very sad democracy called the United States, where rather than fighting over the ideals of a new constitution crafted through this extraordinary democratic process, we're standing on the edge of a cliff, imagining a future governed by a man like this. You could inspire, you have, and you could lead. And Failing democracies like mine would only be helped by that extraordinary example. Thank you very much.